Good morning. Glad to be back, right? I want to address this subject with you this morning. Fishing and following. Fishing and following. Is there any sermon more fitting for me to preach to you than this one? Fishing and following. While you're turning there, let me just say this to you. I love fishing. I make no bones about it. I love hunting. I love sports, but I love fishing. I just love being on the water. There's just something about being out on the water before the sun comes up and watching the sun come up. Something about being on the water in the evening and watching the sun set. There's just something about the peace and tranquility of being out there. I just love it. I love it. I just enjoy it. But if I started this morning's sermon by telling you fishing stories, I probably wouldn't know where to stop. I could probably keep telling story after story. So what I'll do is I'll just start this morning's sermon by showing you a picture. So, you know, you can give me this picture. I want you to see this picture right here. So that is me and my sister. Oh, man, I had a lot of hair back then. That is me and my sister. The very first time my dad ever took me fishing at this little farm pond there in my hometown. Let the record show my fish is bigger than my sister's. Let's be real clear about that. In case my sister watches this online, um, my fish is bigger than hers. She may be better than me at everything in this whole, in this whole world, but she cannot outfish me. And it has been proven since I was four to today. From that day to, to now, I have loved fishing. I have loved it. I have enjoyed it. Even this past week, took my dad to Tennessee for his 72nd birthday. Took him fishing. He actually caught the biggest fish of his life. I love to fish. And when Jesus uses an analogy about fishing, he's got me hooked. Y'all see what I did there? I worked on that one all week, y'all. Come on, man. <laughs> so let's stand together this morning as we read Mark chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 14 through 20, and we're going to address this subject, fishing and following. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Then immediately they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were, who were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat and their hired servants, and they went after Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, help us this morning to be fishers of men. Help us to be fishers of women. Help us to be clear on the message and on our mission. Lord, give us strength when we're weary, joy when we're frustrated, energy when we're tired. Give us wisdom where we're lacking. And Lord, I pray this morning that you will help us in the name of Jesus to be men who fish well and follow well. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated this morning. What does Christ really want from me? That's a question I get often as a pastor. People often ask me, Pastor, what, what does God want from me? Does God want me to do this or that? Does God want me to work here or there? Does God want me to marry this person or that person or go to this school or that school, work at this job or that job? What does God want from me? And I believe this morning that this text that we just read answers the question in four very simple ways. What is it that God wants from me? Many people are totally confused about the nature and the desires of God. Many of you, even in this room, see Christ as nothing more than a religious killjoy. You see God as nothing more than a religious killjoy or a benevolent dictator just waiting on you to mess up so he can pounce on you. So he can strike you down. But the true nature of God is this. Wrath against sin that he poured out on Jesus when he died on the cross. And forgiveness to the humble and to those seeking it. So I ask the question again. What is it that God wants from me? I believe he can answer that question in four very simple ways this morning. And then at the end of the sermon, I'm going to give you a visual illustration with something right here in this bucket. Verse 15 says... Christ says, and when he begins, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. What, notice what he says. Repent and believe in the gospel. First thing I want you to see is this. What does Christ want from you? What does Christ want from me? And what does Christ want from us? Number one, Christ wants you to repent. Repentance means to turn around, to change your mind, to change your God from yourself to Christ. It's a change of direction. And literally, a repentant man will be a changed man. 
And a changed man will also be a repentant man. Repentance was the message all throughout the Bible, especially throughout the New Testament, is what we saw preached again and again and again. John the Baptist preached it. Peter preached it. Paul preached it. And here we see Jesus himself preaching repentance. Repentance is something we always find other people, we always find easy to see in other people, but often miss it in ourselves. Think about it. Think about all the times that you've messed up and justified it. And someone else messed up and you thought they should repent. Do you see how that works? You see how quickly we want to justify our own mistakes, but we quickly think others should repent. Repentance is something we need to capture, and repentance is an attitude we need to live in, recognizing that God is in control and we are not. Listen to what Peter said. Listen to this verse. 2 Peter 3, 9 says this, God is patient with you, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Luke chapter 15 puts it this way. Jesus tells a story and says, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people that don't need to. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Vance Hadron tells this story I thought it was very fitting for this morning. He said, a group of small boys went out to play ball. And they arrived at the playground only to realize that no one had actually brought the ball. He said, one of the young men said, forget the ball, the young fellow said. Let's just go on with the game. We can play the game without the ball. You ready? Let's all start. Havner said, the church is trying to play ball without the ball when we try to win the world without first repenting. He goes on to say, the church can do many things after it repents, but it can do nothing until it repents. He said, the problem that we face in today's church is that we're trying to get people to say, here am I, Lord, send me, long before we ever tell them that they should be saying, Lord, woe is me. We're trying to get them to serve before we make them recognize that they are a sinner in need of Christ. What Jesus wants from you isn't more religious duties. What Jesus wants from you is a broken heart over sin that leads to repentance that results in a changed life. Let me say that again. What Jesus wants from you isn't more religious duties. He wants a broken heart over sin that leads to repentance and results in a changed life. A man who claims to walk with Christ and yet glories in his sin does not walk with Christ and doesn't understand the damning nature of his sin. Repent today, church. For tomorrow may be too late. Repent in this service, you're not guaranteed another one. Repent and turn from your sin and trust Christ today and let yesterday go. Some of you in this room may very well go to hell because your pride will keep you from repentance. Some of you in this room, may, your pride may be so ripe. Your pride may be so overbearing. Your pride may be so, re so relevant in your heart that you miss your own need for repentance. Christ didn't die so you could go to heaven while you continue to live in your sin. Christ, Christ died so that He could change you, that you could repent of your sin and turn to Him. Number one, what does Christ want from you? He wants you to repent. Number two, what does Christ want from you? And look at the second half of the verse. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Number one, He wants you to repent. Number two, He wants you to believe. Believe what? I hear you, Pastor. I'm supposed to believe. I do believe. That's why I'm here. Don't you see us here? Of course we're here. We're here because we believe. We're here so that we'll believe. But believe what? He says here, believe in the gospel, which is essentially the same thing as saying believe in me. The gospel means good news. So when Jesus says believe in the gospel, he is saying believe in me. I'm the good news that you need. You do realize today that we live in a world overrun with bad news. Overrun with bad news. Right, let, me, let me take it a step further. You care if I get on a soapbox for just a minute? Y'all care? It don't matter if you care anyway. I'm going to do it anyway, right? We don't even know if the news is true. Can you, we live in a world where we don't even know if what we're hearing is the truth. So when Jesus says, believe in me, He's saying believe in the gospel. He's saying believe in me. And he is good news. So tonight, if you go home and watch the 6 o'clock news and you go, I don't know if any of this is true. The good news is that Jesus will save you. That's the good news. Regardless of what we hear in this world or see in this world, and regardless of what we have to navigate through to pick and choose to figure out what is or what isn't truth, you can rest in this fact. It is good news. The gospel of Jesus is good news that he will save you today. John 3, 16, the most famous verse in the Bible, puts it this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, watch this, that whoever would believe in him would have everlasting life. Too often we believe in the things of religion 
Too often we believe in the duties of the church. Too often we believe in the programs of the church or the place of the church. But Jesus made it clear that we are to believe in him. When I grew up, my daddy used to make me listen to these Jerry Clower tapes. Y'all know who Jerry Clower is? A couple of y'all do? If you don't, man, you, you're missing out on life. You hadn't lived yet. <laughs> my dad had all his tapes, and he had, he's having this little truck, and he used to pack me and my sisters in there. And uh, this was, you know, before car seats were mandated. And he put us all in this little truck, and he used to make us listen to these tapes over and over. And I'm like, Dad, we know the punchline. We've heard these tapes a thousand times. And my dad just laughed like he never heard it before. I take it some of y'all got a daddy like that, had a daddy like that. We had this one joke. Do y'all remember the story by any chance of Jerry T Clower talking about baptizing the young man? Well, he said, he tells a story and he says that the preacher had, was going to baptize this young guy, this young adult man. And the guy got in the baptistry pool and the preacher looked out at the congregation and he said, he looked at the young man and he said, young man, do you believe? And he said, the young man opened his mouth to answer and before he could get it out, he put him under the water. He said he pulled him back up, and he said when he pulled him up, because he went under with his mouth open, he got water in his mouth, he said he'd come up, and he's going, <coughs> and he said, young man, do you believe? And he said, <coughs> so down he went with him again, pulled him back up a second time, and he said he's all choked up. <coughs> young man, do you believe? Down a third time. So stuck him under, pulled him back up. Young man, do you believe? <coughs> I believe you're trying to kill me, preacher. <laughs> I know the punchline's coming. I still laugh every time. My dad did too. Let me encourage you today. Make sure your belief isn't in the peripheral. Make sure your belief is in the main thing. Make sure your belief isn't in the edge. Make sure your belief is in Christ. Make sure your belief isn't in me. I will let you down. Make sure your belief isn't in this place. Make sure it is in Christ. So let me encourage you today. Make sure your belief is in Christ. Let me play devil's advocate with you this morning. Pastor, you're saying we're supposed to believe. Didn't the Bible actually say in James chapter 2 that even the demons believe? Well, yes, it did. I'm glad you brought that up. But didn't, if the Bible says that even the demons believe and you're telling us that we should believe, then what's the difference? The difference is this. If you keep reading in that passage in James 2 where it says that even the demons believe, we are told that our faith leads us to action. And that action is proof that God has saved us. James calls it faith and works working together. But what we see here is the demons believed, but it didn't change anything about their lives. As a matter of fact, they rebelled against that own, their own belief. And so what we see is this. When a, we as God's people must believe in Christ, and when we believe in Christ, it leads us to action. So when we repent and we believe, it forces us into action. Number one, Christ wants you to repent. Number two, Christ wants you to believe. Number three, look with me in verse 17. Verse 17, he says, Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. So number one, Christ wants you to repent. Number two, Christ wants you to believe. But number three, Christ wants you to follow Him. Verse 17, he said, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. I want you to notice the guys he called. Did you pay any attention to Peter and Andrew and James and John? You'll catch anything about them here. These are average dudes. These are just average working class guys going about their business, doing their job. Actually, some Bible scholars seem to think James and John might have been a little above the middle class because they actually had servants serving on their boats, but Peter and Andrew was doing their own work. What we notice here is that God called average dudes. He didn't call the elites. He didn't call the executives. He called average dudes out of the working class. Abraham Lincoln put it this way. Abraham Lincoln said, God must love the average people because he made so many of us. Truth, right? Notice he called average dudes like you and me. The good news of this is that in the book of Acts, the Bible says that with a few average dudes, the Bible calls it turning the world upside down. That's what they did. That the guys that Jesus called actually flipped the world upside down, just average guys. But notice what they were doing, not just who they were, but notice what they were doing. They were working. They were at work. They were actually doing their job. They actually got up, went to work, was trying to catch fish to make a living. In Bible times in this, in this era, fishing was big business on the Sea of Galilee. So they went to work, and God called them out of their work. So they didn't go to seminary and then come home, graduate, and sit around and say, all right, God, tell me what to do. But they went to work, and God called them out of their work. God called them while they were at work. There's value in working. 
So notice who they were, average dudes. Notice what they were doing. They were working. But notice how God called them. Notice how He called them. He said, follow me. Very simply put, He just said, follow me. He didn't make it complicated. He didn't make it hard. He didn't add to it. He didn't add live it. He didn't, uh, he didn't make it something they had to figure out. He just simply said, follow me. I want you to think about this, church. How, how powerful must a man be to walk by you and you don't know him? And he looks at you at your job and says, come follow me. And just those words were enough to make them drop everything they were doing and go follow him. I love the way William Barclay puts it. William Barclay said, Jesus did not say, I have a theological system which I'd like for you to investigate. Jesus did not say, I have certain theories I would like for you to think over. Jesus did not say that I have an ethical system I'd like to discuss with you. Jesus didn't say any of those things. Jesus just simply said, follow me. So this morning, church, we may mess things up by trying to do other things other than just following Christ. Matthew Henry took it a step further. And he said, when it comes to following Jesus, we must be loosely attached to this world. Loosely attached to this world. Let me, let me show you something. Anytime I share the gospel with someone, you know what? I, I, I rarely, if ever, present the gospel as saying, you can have heaven, you can have hell. And, and somebody says, I'll take hell. Nobody in their right mind does that. Now, somebody who's, you know, medically out of their right mind might choose that. But anybody in their right mind is not going to choose that. You know what? You know what we struggle with? We struggle with getting people to choose between heaven and earth. Because people like what they got here. They like their family here. They like their life here. And so really what we got to get them to choose from is to recognize that all of this is going away. All of this is temporary. All of this is going away. But what Jesus does lasts forever. The danger of following Something other than Christ is this. If you follow yourself, your own heart's deceptive. If you follow man, man is sinful. If you follow social media, it's not always true. My mom used to always say before she died, but I saw it on Facebook. I said, well, that don't mean it's true, mama. Well, then why would they put it on there? Because people liars, mama, that's why. Because people sinners. She just saw the good. But the danger of following social media is not always true. The danger of following our culture is that it rarely, if ever, will follow Christ. The danger of following your, following your friends, they're flawed too. Let me give you an illustration. When I grew up, I went to a school called Mayo Elementary. And we had K through 7, and high school was 8 through 12. And after my 8th grade year, we got a middle school, and it kind of broke it up a little bit more. But I had this humongous elementary school. I mean, it was massive. We had two halls. A hallway for the first, second, third, and fourth graders, and a hallway for fifth, sixth, and seventh graders. And in between, there was the cafeteria and the, and the office, and then on the back side was the area for the kindergartners. And outside those two hallways, at the end of both hallways, y'all try to picture this if you can, at the end of those two hallways, there were two sets of double doors on each side. They give the little hallway one recess, and the upper hallway the, another recess. And when we would come out of those doors, at Mayo Elementary, now, at the time, it seemed gigantic. If I go back now, it's probably not nearly as big as I thought it was when I was a kid. But you come out those doors, and there's a space of about 15, 10, 15 yards, and then it's straight downhill. And down in this huge valley is the playground. Over here to the far right is where you can play football. Then there's a set of swings that run this way. Then there's a monkey bars right here, and there's this little fire truck you could play on. Then over here to the left, they had this thing called the Scout Tower. Don't even really know what it was, just a whole bunch of stuff you could climb on. And then over here was a basketball court, and behind it was a baseball field, and then just an open field that you could just run and play. But every kid that got their first recess of the day would usually be around 10, 1030 in the morning. And the teacher would be teaching, and she would be doing the best she could, and she would close up her books and say, all right, kids, time for recess. And so we would all run out those back doors and just bust through them. And as soon as you run out of them, the whole class and the neighboring class and the class behind you, everybody's running down that hill. And so maybe, maybe that day you, you want to go to the swings and all your buddies is going to the basketball court. When you start running down that hill, you got a decision to make. Am I going to the swings or am I going to follow my friends? You start running down that hill and half of them is going to play football and some of them want to go climb on the fire truck. Half of them want to chase the girls and half of them want to go over here to the baseball field. And as you're running down that hill, to us little kids, that hill was never ending. And we're running down that hill and you got a decision to make. Am I going to follow these other kids? Am I going to follow my friends? Am I going to follow these strangers? Or am I going to do it my own way? Am I going to go do what I want to do? 
And faced with the decision, you got this decision on your hands. Who to follow and what to do. He may be saying, I won't follow anybody. I'll blaze my own trail. I, I got you. I hear you. But go with me for the purpose of the illustration. You got to choose who you're going to follow down that hill and what are you going to do. And today as a Christian, that is no different in our culture than what it looked like for elementary school kids running down the hill trying to figure out where they're going to go play and what they're going to do and who they're going to follow. Guess what me and you are doing every day in this society? Trying to figure out who we're going to follow and what we're going to do. Are we going to follow Jesus? Are we going to follow Christ? And are we going to do what he said do? Number one, Christ wants you to repent of your sin. Number two, he wants you to believe in him. Number three, he wants you to follow him. Just simply follow Christ. Fourth. Verse 17, he said, not only follow me, but he said, I will make you become fishers of men. Number four, Christ wants you to fish for men. Or let me put it to you simpler or more simple. Christ wants you to go fishing. You realize today God wants you to go fishing. So I, I said this in the first service in hopes that my wife would understand loud and clear. When I go fishing, I'm just doing God's work here, honey. This is, this is between me and God. But God wants you to go fishing because he says, I will make you become fishers of men. Listen, the souls of men and women is always the mission of the church. And far too many times we get sidetracked. Far too many times we get all worked up over something that's not the mission. And the mission is always souls, the souls of men and women. Not to preach an old sermon to you that I preached years ago, but the mission is fishing. That's the mission, church. The mission is fishing. Let me ask you this question. Let me, let me, let me pause so it can marinate a minute so you can think about it. If the church succeeds at anything other than than reaching souls, then what did we really do? If the church succeeds at anything other than reaching souls, then what exactly did we succeed at? Jesus said, I will make you become fishers of men. That eliminates all your excuses this morning. You may be thinking, Pastor, I'd like to do what God told me to do, but I don't have time, I don't have the gifts, I don't have the resources, I can't do all this. Well, here's the beauty. Did you notice what Jesus said? He said, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Jesus didn't say, follow me and I hope that you'll become a fisher of men. Jesus didn't say, follow me and maybe you got the gifts to be a fisher of men. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you. And so what we see here is this. So you say, I don't have time. Christ will make a way. You say, I don't have the gift. Christ will make a way. I don't have the resources. Christ will make a way. I don't have the abilities to be a fisher of men. You don't have to have the abilities. God said he will make you into it. Church family, I can't stress this point enough to you today. The souls of men and women has to be our mission. And if it's not, then what exactly are we doing? I want you to notice a couple things with me from this text, from this verse, and I'm going to show you a visual illustration. Notice what happened in this text. Notice that Peter and Andrew left their nets to follow him. Look with me, if you will, in verse 16. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, verse 16, he saw Simon, that's Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. They left their nets to follow him. Why is that significant? This is all they had known. They've been fishing their whole life. This is all they knew was fishing, and they left it to follow Jesus. But then he says, if you, if you continue reading, that James and John left their father and their servants in the boat. So first we see this. We see Peter and Andrew left the only thing they'd ever known for, for providing, for work. They left it to follow Jesus. Second, we see James and John, they left their father. Probably the most important person in their life. They left him to follow Jesus. They also left, it says they left the other hired servants, their acquaintances, their old acquaintances. Everything, they left it for the cause of Christ. So you saying, Pastor, are you telling me I need to leave? Man, I was born and raised here in West Lincoln. I ain't going nowhere. I ain't leaving. I'm not asking you to leave here. I'm asking you, will you leave your sin? I'm asking you, will you leave your pride? Will you leave your gossip at the door? Will you leave all those things for the cause of Christ? But notice what happens here. In verse 16, there's a group casting a net. And in verse 19, there's a group mending a net. So what we have is one group trying to catch fish and the other group getting ready to catch fish. So when it comes to following Christ, we need to be reaching souls or getting ready to reach souls. 
or laying the foundation to reach souls. Let me give you a visual illustration here. So in this bucket, you, you, I don't know if you can see it all online. So here's a cast net. You know what a cast net is? You just you throw it out and it circles out and you catch bait fish or fish in it. So this is the smaller, one of my smaller nets. It's a six foot net. It's supposed to be camouflaged. So when it goes in the water, the fish can't see it. It's got these weighted weights on it so it'll sink. It's got this long rope so you can pull it in. You know what? It opens six foot. You can throw it. You might catch a fish. You might not. You can throw it. You can get it hung. You can throw it. Maybe nothing happens. You pull up a bunch of algae. You may be looking at this net this morning and going, you know what, Pastor? If I were you, I wouldn't throw a six foot net. That's too small. I'd throw an eight foot. Or I'd learn to throw a 10 foot. Or I'd learn to throw a 12 foot. You won't even have to throw it one time. You throw that six foot like a hundred times to catch fish. You learn to throw a 12 footer, you won't have to throw it once. You may be saying, but Pastor, I also think you ought to throw those white nets. It's clear. When it hits the water, you won't see it. That's what everybody at the beach does when I see them throwing it on the, on the shore. Pastor, you know what I think? I think those weights aren't heavy enough. If you got heavier weights, it'll sink faster. You'll catch more fish. You know what else I think? I think this rope right here, it tears up your hands. You need a smoother rope, and it won't, it won't hurt your hands as bad. I get you. I hear that. You know what else I notice about this net? It ain't catching nothing until we throw it. it, it it's just going to sit here. What? It won't do anything. It just sits right here. You know, what my, you know what my theory is, church? Here's my theory. We need to stop talking about all the things of religion and start casting the net. We need to stop talking about all the things religion does or doesn't do, and we need to cast the net. But pastor, if I cast, if I cast the net, I might not catch nothing. You're right. I've thrown that thing a thousand times and pulled, up, pulled it up empty. I didn't stop throwing it. I threw that thing a couple times. It's been tied back together twice because I threw it, got it hung up, and ripped it. But guess what? I still throw it. At some point, you've got to just throw the net. Yeah, sure, you might not catch nothing. You might only catch one. You might throw it a hundred times and catch one little bitty fish this big. You might, not, you might throw it a hundred times, and on the hundred and first time you throw it, you might catch more fish than you could ever even pull in. You need help to get it in the boat. But you've got to throw the net. And what I notice is this. Too many times when it comes to Christianity, we love to talk about it. We love to talk about the net. We love to talk about the size of the net, the look of the net, the, the perfection or imperfections of the net, what the net should do, what the net shouldn't do, what the net could do, and what it couldn't do. But at some point, you got to throw the net. And it's just the same thing with the gospel. You can come to church and we can talk about all the things we do wrong. You can talk about all the things we should do right. You can talk about all the things the church should do and all the ways the church hurt you and all the things that went wrong and all the ways that you wish the church was different and how the music didn't work this morning and how the preacher was bad this morning and how the baptismal water was, was wrong this morning. Whatever you want to talk about. It. At some point, you got to throw the net. you just got to throw the net and throw it and let God fill it up. Well, what if I throw it in the wrong place? Throw it again. What if I throw it and get home? Throw it again. What if I throw it and I only pull in a couple? Throw it again. You know why it's important you throw the net? Somebody threw the net to you. Somebody threw it to you. Somebody threw it and it called you. Now you're going to sit back and talk about the net? Throw it. Throw it. That's what we do with the gospel. When we repent of our sin and we, we believe in Christ and we follow Him, He makes us fishers of men. We throw the net of the gospel and we let him fill it up. Amen. What if he doesn't fill it up? Then that's on him. I am not responsible for the results of a sermon. I am not responsible for the results of sharing the gospel. I am not responsible for the growth or demise of this church. You know what I'm responsible for? Presenting the gospel and leaving the results up to God. Throw the net. Throw it, church. And keep throwing it. You may be saying, Pastor, this morning I'm tired. I've been throwing the net my whole life and I haven't seen any results. Keep throwing it. Pastor, I've been working in this church since I was a kid. Keep throwing it. Pastor, I've been trying and I'm frustrated and I'm tired of the work and I'm weary of the work. And people hurt me and people have stabbed me in the back and the church has lied about me and people have done me wrong. Just keep casting the net. Just keep casting the net. Listen, church. Can I be 100% honest with you this morning? I don't love everything about fishing, but I love catching them. You know what? I don't love the work of throwing the net, but I love catching them. I'd prefer not to pay for a boat trailer tag, but I love catching fish. I'd prefer not to have to pay for fishing license, but I love catching fish. 
I'd prefer not to have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go fishing, but I love to catch fish. I'd prefer not to drive six and a half hours to Tennessee to catch fish, but I love to catch them. I'd prefer not to have to, to change the oil in my motor. I don't even know how to do that kind of stuff, barely. But I love to catch fish. I'd prefer not to have to sit around at home and tie the net when it rips, but I love to catch fish. I'd prefer not to tie hooks, but I love to catch fish. I'd prefer not to have to stay out till 2 o'clock in the morning trying to find the right spot, but I love to catch fish. I'd prefer, like I said before, not to have to get up in the wee hours of the morning to go, but I love to catch fish. The love of catching trumps all the work. And that, is, that should, should be the cause of the church, that our love for Christ trumps all the work. That our love for Jesus trumps everything else that we do. That our love for Jesus is what allows us to press on. That our love for Jesus lets us keep throwing the net. That our love for Jesus is greater than the work. So maybe today you're thinking, I don't want to serve on this committee anymore. Just keep working. You may be thinking, Pastor, I don't want to get up and pray early in the mornings anymore. I say, keep casting the net. Pastor, I don't want to do all these things anymore. I'm tired and I've been working a long time. And it's time to give it up and let somebody else do it this morning. I've been working my whole life and I am beat and I am tired, and I'm just ready to throw in the towel, I'm saying, don't throw in the towel, throw the net. Don't throw in the towel, church, throw the net. The towel will not catch souls, the net will. Amen. Let me consider, I want to ask you to consider this question this morning, and I'll be done. If you aren't fishing, are you really following if you aren't fishing, are you really following? Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. And if you don't care about the souls of men and women, are you really following Christ? In conclusion, Jesus desires that you would repent. Jesus desires that you would believe in Him. The desire of Jesus is that you would follow Him, very simply put, and He will make you be fishers of men. This morning, I want to encourage you to give your life to Christ. Maybe you're sitting there and you're saying, Pastor, I've given my life to Christ a long time ago. I want to encourage you this morning before we leave to remember to throw the net. Just keep throwing it, church. Keep throwing the net. And this week when you get tired, throw it some more. And this week when you throw it and you pull it back and it's empty, throw it again. And this week when people look at you like you're foolish, just keep throwing the net and leave the results to God. Amen, church? Let's stand together this morning. I want to remind you of all the things that we mentioned to you at the beginning of the service. Keep praying for our deacons. Keep praying that the Lord will keep saving people and we can keep baptizing more people. Keep supporting Christian ministries throughout the month of August. Keep praying for those new deacons that will come on if you so agree with our current deacons. And this morning, I encourage you, go out into this community Go to work this week. Go to school this week. Go back to your family. Go to your neighborhood. Keep casting the net. Let's pray together this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you for Mount Vernon. God, we confess, all of us in this room confess today that we're guilty of getting tired of throwing the net. But Lord, I pray that you will help us to keep casting and leave the results up to you. We love you and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.